<laughs> yes. <laughs> we made awesome. it. Awesome. The tech was letting us down. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like to, to be honest, I was scared for a second. Otherwise, we could have, you know, just rescheduled. But thank you so no much problem. for being Great here to today, be, yeah. Will. Yeah. Um, Will, by the way, this is my second session in English. So I'm so happy that you agreed to be here. I, I think, you know, Turkish students or, you know, anyone from, from the, you know, corporate world, maybe, um, they, they have a lot to, you know, hear from you. So sincerely, thank you so much for no, agreeing to No, no problem at all. I'm, I'm genuinely really excited to be here. You know, um, and I'm sure we'll tell the students shortly, that Turkey's, Turkey holds a very sort of dear place in my heart. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we can just, you know, start the conversation right now. Um, could you please tell us a little sure. bit about Sure. So I guess maybe just a little bit of background. I'm South African born and raised, um, you know, went to school there, studied university there, um, did all of my formative schooling there. Uh, and I actually started my career um, working for a ski resort uh, in South Africa. So of ev all of the places that you could potentially go and actually see um, You know, that was where I kind of started. I guess I'm, I'm quite lucky to have ended up um, being married to who I am, uh, considering that I was starting uh, my life in, in that way. Mel, I think, put up, uh, puts up with a lot and a lot of grandiose ideas for me. Um, I spent the first seven odd years of my career uh, working in construction and um, like project engineering. That was really what I was doing. Um, between either constructing like hardcore houses right through to um, actual mining engineering. So I did a whole bunch of that. Um, I also sort of studied completely correspondence. So I actually didn't uh, spend any time studying full time at university. I was always working and studying at the same time. Um, and today uh, I'm an emerging payments and business development director for City. Um, I spend all of my time, I guess, in front of the West Coast technology clients for City. I'm very lucky to be able to do that. Uh, and I guess I have the, the real benefit of being able to um, essentially talk to the most innovative companies in the world about what it is they want to do from a payment standpoint, which is very exciting. I get to, to think about how City is trying to build its network of the future and help to, to drive, I guess, some of the innovation decisions we make there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Will, by the way, uh, while you were telling me about your, you know, first years of, you know, jobs, and, you know, I didn't know there was a ski resort in yeah, South there... Africa. Like, this is the first time it is, that I've It is a about very, this. very small ski resort. Uh, it would not compare to places like Kartalkaya or any of those in Turkey. Um, I, by the way, when I was uh, living in Turkey, I, I spent most of my weekends either studying for my MBA or um, actually up in, in the mountains snowboarding. Um, so Kartalkaya was like my favorite place. Really? Um, so Radical Tour, who were the guys that did most of the organizing, used to like take us out of Istanbul in the morning. We'd go spend a day on the mountain and then come home in the evening. So um it's nowhere nowhere near as good as that amazing but, uh, Tiffindel is still a, a fun little place to go and do a little bit of skiing and it's it, to that point it's the only one in south africa there's also one more in lesotho which is a small country that's inside south africa um but uh, yeah they're they're tiny compared to what you would see in turkey but still like i i learned something new today so i'm i'm re really happy already um, Will, who would you like to yeah, address Yeah, so today? it's a good question, actually. When you'd sent this one over, I thought a little bit about this. Um, I think what I would, the, the students and the, the groups I would like to reach out to is anyone who's lost or feels lost um, about what they actually want to do. I feel like my career for any of those people is like the perfect example of not knowing what you want to do doing what's in front of you anyway, being able to then do a lot of things and still have a really fulfilling career. Um, you know, I've, I've fallen into a lot of, of jobs. I've been lucky in a lot of, lo like a, lot of lo a lot of opportunities. I've been lucky in a lot of things that I've done. Um, and in fact, actually looking back now, it's probably that diversity of experience that has really set me apart from my peers and has helped me to be successful, um, you know, in terms of what I've done now. So I, I, You know, I don't think that I would think about things the same way a lot of my peers do because of that diversity of experience. So this message is probably for them. Um, and then maybe the second group of people that I would address is um, 
for people, and especially in today's world, people that feel like they have to be successful, like right now, like you've got to get out there and be a superstar tomorrow. Like I would say, be patient. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, and, and I will tell you personally, it's the hardest thing to do. I myself have been very ambitious from day one. Um, so it's really hard for me to sit here and tell you, don't be impatient. Cause I was definitely impatient right throughout my career, but I will tell you this, like continuing to work hard and continuing to work on, on, um, things that excite you and interest you will definitely help you get there in the long run. So be patient. Things definitely do come your way. Um, I will say that I found my career to be far more progressive in my thirties than I did in my twenties. Um, things in my twenties just didn't seem to run as quickly as I wanted them to. Um, you know, so I, I would say to people, be patient. It, it will definitely come. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because so far, like um, many of the guests that I've, you know, uh, hosted for Career Journey series, they, they all said, you know, something about patience, because I think new gen, um, we tend to be kind of impatient over everything. So it's, it's good to hear that from you as well, because it, it's, it's valuable. Um, so in order to start, you know, with my first question for you, I think it's really important, you know, apart from your banking career, you started by, you know, studying engineering in South Africa. Um, we see that, you know, many Turkish students are now, or, you know, past 10 years considering studying abroad and also South Africa as well. So how was studying, you know, engineering itself and then studying that in South Africa? Mm. I know that it's your native country, but at the same time, would you suggest that to Turkish students to, to you know, so having that been as someone an that has spent time in Turkey and knowing how much Turkish people love good food and especially like meat, um, get out to South Africa and go and study for the food and sort of wine scene alone. It's absolutely amazing from that front. Like the, the <laughs> country is absolutely beautiful. It's an amazing place to, to live. And it's the people are incredibly friendly and endearing. People want to help. People want to be part of your story. So I, I would highly recommend recommend it as a location to go and um, study. Um, myself personally, I've, I've always had a weird studying experience, right? And the reason for that is that because I, I went to work full time, I was kind of like a practitioner student, right? And um, so, so one, I would, I would highly recommend anyone studying anything in the engineering field. Um, I specialized in project management. That was really what I was interested in. I specifically liked the idea of resource management and, you know, thinking about how projects could be run for, um, for engineering, but it's a pretty wide sphere, right? So my first, if I think about my, my first two kind of roles, when I was working for that ski resort, I was really working as a project manager, right? So I was project managing all of the construction projects we were doing up there. Um, and the, the second body of work that I was doing was actually more as a project management consultant. So I was consulting to hardcore mining houses and we were, you know, doing everything from resource planning right through to thinking through how the construction itself was working. Um, and then later on, I went into like sort of a civil technician type of work where we were doing everything from designing roads to designing sort of how we would handle water around mines. That was kind of the type of work I was specializing in. Um, what I'll tell you is, is this. The one is I, I'm a huge believer in diversity of experience. So while I loved my engineering and I loved the project management side of what I'd studied. I definitely think that um, the second second component of what I studied, which was actually I did a BCom LLB, so I did law, as I said, the second follow up. Um, it also definitely helped to add a slightly different lens to how I'd seen everything from when I was growing up in engineering. I wasn't just sort of focused on on one or two. Um, you know, distinctive things in terms of how I was actually studying and how I was actually working. So one, yes, I would highly recommend anyone from Turkey that wants to go and study in South Africa, go and do it. It is an amazing place to live and work. Um, and, you know, I think that just the diversity of thinking and the diversity of thought that people will get from going to our country will be enough of a, enough of a, a benefit um, as, it, as it is. Great. Um... And, you know, leaving engineering that, you know, your experiences in that field aside, uh, how did you start your career in banking? Like, how, how did you decide that? Like, did someone, you know, push you through it? Or, you so know, what, good how, question. How uh, I probably have the weirdest story of how I, and again, this, this probably leans a little to what I'd said earlier to everybody, like, be okay with things happening to you and then just working really hard at things that come your way. Um, 
I didn't really choose banking, to be honest. Um, what, what had happened was, is I went through a bit of a strange discovery period in my life uh, in 2010. I was doing pretty well or starting to do pretty well in engineering. So there was no real reason for me to think about changing careers. Um, we had a bit of a, I would call it like a dark moment in our life. Um, so my wife, uh, Mel, at the time, um, she was my girlfriend. We were outside her parents' house. We were actually hijacked. Um, so we had people walk up and basically take our car. It was a big mind shift moment for us. It made us question a lot about like what we were doing. I in particular decided that I no longer wanted to do engineering. It wasn't really for me. Um, and at the time I was reading a book uh, by a guy named Sandy Weil called The World's Banker. And it was his story about Citigroup and how they'd merged Traveler Group, Travelers Group and Citicorp. Um, and before that, I had not even really been aware that City was in South Africa and randomly came out after dropping my wife off at a, um, at a girl's night out, uh, randomly drove past City's offices uh, in Santon in South Africa. You, you, went, you <laughs> went online that night uh, and applied for a job at the bank. Um, didn't know a soul at City, didn't know a single person there. Went online, applied that night uh, and... <laughs> I can imagine you just told me that you didn't even know yeah, that city existed I didn't in know you know, there, right? South Africa. And, and, you know, went, went online. And before I knew it, I was like going through a series of interviews and was flown to London um, to go and interview with them. Um, and I remember sitting through some of the interview processes going like, I have no idea why this bank would choose me, right? Like I'm a guy who's got like seven years of, you know, project engineering experience, um, who studied a law degree. And like, now I'm asking if I can come into banking. So I, I interestingly <laughs> don't really see myself as somebody who, um, you know, was like, I didn't go to university and was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into to, to banking and that's going to be my, my life. Um, you know, I, I think I kind of got lucky in falling into it. And it was something that was in front of me that looked really interesting um, and actually has given me a fantastic 12 year career to date in banking. Well, you know, when, since we started talking about city, like it also opened some gates for you in terms of international experience. So you worked so far in USA, South Africa, Turkey, and I'm sure that you've been in touch with so many people around the globe. Um, what would you think of those experiences? Do you think that, you know, they're valuable, like how, how, how they changed your per perception yeah, so, of things? So the, the interesting thing is um, this could be an incredibly short answer. Uh, basically, it's essential. Like the reality is, I think getting out into the world and getting international work experience um, is not a, it's not like something I recommend to people. I think it's a requirement to be a well-rounded person in an international corporation. If you're thinking about international an international career, you have to get out into the network. You have to go out and see people. You have to go out and work in different countries. Um, I, I feel incredibly blessed to have been able to work in, in full time in three different locations. I've also managed to do some short term assignments. I spent a little bit of time in the UK and I've also spent some time in Kenya. Um, you know, all of these different experiences in my mind give you such a significant cultural shift in terms of how you think. It's it's just insane. Like one of the things I'll, I'll give you a, a short picture on is, you know, when I left South Africa to go and do um my, my time and my, my sort of uh, work experience in Turkey, uh, we landed there and I was nowhere near ready for the density of Istanbul. Like the, the number of people per area is really high, right? Like every building is like six foot tall and it's just like miles. Yeah. Well, by the way, I have to interrupt you there because I really want to learn this. Like, why did you choose <laughs> Turkey for, for that assignment? Like, I'm Okay, like, absolutely. I really I'll want definitely to hear get that. there. I mean, so so one, I'll tell you that that the, the first of all, I was not prepared for Turkey. Just to give you an idea, like I arrived the first day, the taxi driver didn't speak English. I didn't speak Turkish, and he got lost on my way to my uh, my corporate housing. So, and he was like talking to me in Turkish. I had no idea like where I was even going. By the end, by the way, I could speak a little bit of basic Turkish. So I had a, a great time, um, you know, being able to to really get around. Um, we, we have a standing joke because I got engaged to my wife just before I went to Turkey and only came home three weeks before we got married. So I didn't want to come home. Like I absolutely <laughs> stumble. Um, why I chose it. That's a, it's a great question. Um, so 
I remember distinctly the conversations that were going around about the opportunities there were for my rotation, right? Because so City has these great international rotation programs where, uh, as an analyst, one of the benefits you get is that you get to go out there and effectively spend some time uh, in the network, learning another country, learning another culture, right? Like when I mentioned about this, this experience being essential, like I really genuinely mean it. Um, so why did I choose Turkey? Well, I was, I was, kind of proposed two options. Um, we were on a call with HR and they said, look, we have two options for you, right? The one is you can go and do um, London because London is one of our big hubs and it's a great place you can go and learn. Or two, um, you can go to Turkey. And the other two analysts were like, oh, no, no, I want to go to London. I want to go to London. I was like, that's great. Like in my mind, Turkey was such a it was such a different opportunity and such a different experience that I had absolutely no, like in my mind, there was no distinction. Like London is always going to be there. There's always going to be opportunities to go to London, but I was never sure that there was going to be an opportunity to go to Turkey again. And I remember going, so one of my big coffee buddies in South Africa is a guy named Jeff Gersell. Um, he's actually Turkish by, by heritage. He's American. He was American born and raised, but his parents are, are Turkish. Um, and I remember going and having a conversation with him and saying, Jeff, you know, like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm really keen on doing trade, which was the, the, the product I wanted to do. And Turkey was like a great trade hub for city. And, and like they said, do you know, do you want to go to Turkey? I said, should I do it? And he said, well, like, this isn't even a question. Go to Turkey. Um, and so I listened to him. I packed my bags and said to HR, look, I don't want to go to London. I'd rather do Turkey. And it actually turned out to be the best thing ever. Like, one of the things I will tell people is there's a lot of like, you know, glitz and glamour and going and doing your rotations in the US and doing your rotations in London and all that. But one, the cultural experience of Turkey was, I, in my mind, 50 times better. Like I, I just loved every minute of being there. And number two, because it, was a, it wasn't a big hub, um, you're always going to do more work than you would learning in another location. You know, you're because so the, the reality is, is they let, tend to have less resourcing. So the reality is, is I was I was an actual product manager in Turkey because they were short of people. So I had this great benefit of being able to actually be a product manager and, and um, essentially learn in Turkey. So very simply, it was one of the options that came up and I chose it over London. So uh, there you go. Will, at the same time, you told me that you had some other assignments as well. And you said that, you know, it's just, you know, plainly essential. Um, what other skill sets that you acquired, you know, during the past years, like hobbies or, you know, interest areas that you can, you know, recommend to high school students or university students that are watching? Sure. Um, so maybe I'd start with like the, the skill sets that I'd, I'd maybe been lucky enough to acquire through these, these organizations and, and things that I would recommend that people yeah. try and focus on as they're thinking about their own careers. Um, the, the first is Please. like, yeah. one of the things I didn't realize is how influential you can be without actually managing people. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be a people manager in order to be able to influence up or influence your peers or influence thinking inside an organization. And, um, ironically, it's often a more important skill. Like it's actually easier to manage a team and just, you know, be dictatorial and say, this is how I want things done and just get people to do them. Um, influencing is a far more difficult skill to learn and to really get good at. So one of the things I would, I would highly recommend to students if they're thinking about their time is think about how you influence people, the sphere of influence that you have. Um, and a lot of that, I, you know, again, a lot of this is somewhat linked, right? Some of it comes back to how you think culturally. Some of it comes back to the experiences that you've got. And the more you're able to put yourself into other people's shoes, the more likely you are to be able to have a good outcome at influencing them um, and being genuinely interested in them. So the one skill set I would say that the, the, the professional life I've had has been able to bring me as influence. So I really do, do think that people need to stay focused on that. The second is um, I had a, a great boss who always used to tell me um, um, that, that if you take care of your career, if you take care of your performance, your career will take care of itself. Um, you know, he was a boss for a long time with me. And one of the things I'll tell you is, is that, I, you know, what he really meant in my mind was staying 100% focused on execution. Like people underestimate how impactful you can be just by executing. Um, you know, people really tend to try and focus on having a great story to tell or, you know, trying to, to have a great presentation that they can show out to people. 
I, I think that one of the things I've learned is just do things like actually when you say you're going to do something, go out and do it. Like if you're a student who says to their, their lecturer that I'm going to go and do X, Y, Z project, actually go and execute it. There is a premium paid for people that are um, actually executors in this world. Right. And I think we actually don't have enough people that execute. We have a lot of people that can tell great stories, but we don't have a lot of people that execute incredibly well and actually deliver things. So one of the things I will tell you um, is find good mentors. Like I've, I, like I had, who've been, been along the way telling me things like, you know, take care of your performance and your career will take care of yourself. So execution skills is a big one. Um, and then I think the other thing I would, I would put out there is, anyone can learn anything. So any subject is not out of reach of someone learning. Like if anyone ever tells you that it's too difficult to learn something or that this is a niche thing that only certain people can learn, that's just entirely not true. Like, I don't think what we do is overly complicated. Um, you know, I've, I've, the reason a lot of senior people in these organizations can do what they do is because they've got scars. They've gone out and executed, they've gone out and influenced, they've gone out and managed people and they failed or they've, they've tripped up or they've not done it perfectly. They've learned far more from those scar based experiences than they have from others. So I think when you're thinking about your career, the two skills I think that are absolutely the most critical out of any of them is influence and execution skills. I think those are the ones that people have to absolutely get right. Um, in terms of experience, uh, in terms of hobbies, you'd asked the second question about the hobbies um, that I'd had that have had an impact on me. Um, I think the two that, that I would probably bring up, the first is guitar. So I played guitar for a long time, um, since I was uh, about 11, 12 years old. Uh, it is a highly um, impactful thing of what I do. And, and I often find I've got a weird relationship with it. Sometimes I'll be very focused on um, guitar and I'll be playing all the time and I'll be, you know, it's a great way for you to get out of your way and get your head out of everything that you're doing because you're so concentrated on an instrument. Um, any musical instrument in my mind is great. Um, it's just a very, very great way of disconnecting from the world, uh, which I think is a, a needed thing today. So I think guitar has been a great way for me to help disconnect from what, what's going on around me. Um, and the second is a hobby I've taken up a little bit during um, COVID has been um, working on cars, like taking cars and rebuilding them and, and that type of thing. It's a patience skill. Um, it's, a, it's a patience game. Um, you can get highly frustrated with it at times. And because you're working in such a small environment, it, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a metaphor for life because you're kind of effectively trying to work on a, on a small area to try and improve it. Um, and I'll, I'll say that there are times when I have thought like really, you know, like really sort of hard about whether it's something I want to still do over a weekend or what's something that I want to try and like enjoy. But I, I found you, you kind of start with something that needs a little bit of work and you're really helping to smooth it out. And actually you end up with something that, that is better than it was before. And it takes a long time and it's, it's meticulous work and it's very, very sort of like slow going. So one of the things that I've loved about that hobby has just been, um, the, the opportunity it's given to me to be patient, you know, talking again about this patience we've mentioned earlier. <laughs> That's perfect, Will. Because, you know, the reason that I, I, I started asking this hobby question, you know, during the past five uh, live sessions, I think, because I feel like, um, you know, when, when we're growing up, we have some hobbies, but we tend to leave them aside when when we start working in the you know in the, in the corporate world or any kind of job that we have yet you know I, I i feel like you know those people who has some you know any kind of hobbies at the same time with a job um they tend to be more relaxed they tend to be able to cope with stress in a you know more more peaceful way so that's why i i really want to you know ask this question to my guests from from now on and I see that there's a pattern, like an obvious pattern. So that's why I want to hear, I want to make sure that the students hear that they can have a hobby and at the same time have a, you know, a, a packed job or, or whatever they may have. So thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I, I really want to hear, you know, about your thoughts for specifically high school students, because as you told me, like sometimes we, we, we study a bachelor's degree in a field that we don't want to work in. And they have the stress, especially in Turkey, because in Turkey, we have the university entrance exams. We have high school entrance exams. We have exams for everything. So they feel like when they're studying for those, they, they have to choose something and they're stuck with it for life. 
So that's why, what would you, you know, suggest them not only for, you know, choosing a field, but, you know, in a, in a general sense as well. Wow. Yeah, yeah Turkey of students, um, obviously. <laughs> so look, I, I think anytime you're in a country that offers you a lot, which is like what Turkey does, you know, it's the type of place people can actually live and have a great career without ever leaving the country. Um, you know, the one thing I would say is, is, be okay with all of this. Like it, it's true that what you're saying is, is tough, right? Because I remember it. So South Africa has a very similar type of system, right? Like when you get to what we would call like the ninth grade, um, essentially they force you to choose subjects, right? Like you have to pick subjects that are like, you know, exactly. and, and to be honest, like I dropped Same. things like accounting. I never took accounting to my final years of high school. And yet I did a, a bachelor of commerce degree where I did finance to like my final years, right? So why... Like, so, so here's the, here's the thing I will tell um, high school students is pick the stuff that you're interested in. I, I would, I'm still very much, and maybe this is just the, the way I'm wired, but I still am very much a proponent, a proponent for believing that you should take maths and science because they teach you critical thinking. Um, and it's, it's quite funny. I, I was always pretty good at math, but hated it. It was not a subject I enjoyed when I was in high school at all. Like it was one of those subjects where I was like, oh gosh, you know, give me another sum to do and another, another bit of mathematics to do. And I had parents that forced me through the Kumon system. So I had to like learn Kumon and, you know, so I had a lot of like really interesting, um, weird background experiences. So I would tell, a high, tell high school students, first of all, like, I, I don't think that you should kind of be too concerned about it. Pick a couple of the core subjects that really matter, but don't worry too much about the fact that you've got to pick a couple of electives that are going to be beyond uh, what you do. That's number one. Number two is I don't even think that your high school, your, your university studies really dictate or decide what you're going to do unless you're going to go into a profession, right? Like if you're going to go into medicine or if you're going to go into one of those, of course you have to study a highly specialized yeah. degree. But you know, if I think about like a BCom law degree, which is what I, I had done as my main undergrad, um, they're not, it's, it's quite a diverse degree still, right? Like you can still add diversity into the degree. So you can go out there and as you're thinking about the subjects that you do choose, you can pick subjects that are, um, that are pretty, are pretty broad, right? You can pick subjects that are not kind of hell of a focused on one or two things. And um, so I would definitely say to people, look, don't be too concerned about what it is that you pick. Just pick something that does hold some value. And I do think, I do think that there is some value in specializing a little bit, right? Like, so picking a subject that, for example, like when I did a BCom, I could have just done a general degree, but actually adding law has been fantastic because the stuff that I have learned from law in terms of contract management, in terms of like business, um, has been highly beneficial to me in a, um, in, in an actual banking career, because in a banking career, a lot of the time we're negotiating contracts, right? A lot of the time we're looking at legal terms and conditions as a product manager. So I think yeah. one, don't be too nervous about it. Pick a couple of key subjects that really matter. Um, and then don't worry too much about the outcome because the reality is, is if I look at my career, I've been able to reinvent myself a couple of times. Right. And that's, that's, that should make people feel, you know, incredibly comforted that actually it's just important that you're, taking what you're learning and realizing that it's applicable across a number of different fields, right? I mean, who would have thought that a guy who comes from an engineering background, who didn't really want to do engineering, who studied law, who didn't really want to do law, could then do okay in banking, right? I mean, this, this is a really weird outcome to see. Um, but the reality is, is that so many people I know Will, but no, you're no. being humble with saying <laughs> doing okay, that's like, I, I, I don't want to, you know, ob object, you know, to you a lot, but at the same time, it's not okay. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's, it's yeah, very kind of you, but I genuinely just see it as I've, I've been, I've had, I've, been, I've had a lot of luck and I've worked really hard, right? And I've had a lot of really good mentors, which by the way, is one of the pieces of advice I will give later. Um, one of the things I will say uh, is, is be okay with that reinvention process. Be okay with the fact that the skill sets you have are applicable. Make sure you understand that when you're thinking through the skill sets you're developing, that most of them can be transferred. Like I never thought about project management being such an incredibly powerful skill to help drive execution. But all you do in project management is learn how to execute, right? Like that's all project management teaches you. And um, so that, that's number one. One, I think don't be too, too nervous about that. The second is travel. Like 
get out there and travel, like go and see the world. Like Turkey is such a, a great place. You're so close to Europe. You're so close to Northern Africa. You're so close to the Middle East. Like get out there and see the world. It's not expensive to get out there and do those things. I would highly recommend people do that. Um, and then the third thing I would say, um, which I think is an important lens to keep no matter what people are doing is have fun. Like, I don't think that this really matters on any industry that you're in. I know so many people that are in fun industries that like hate their jobs because they haven't chosen to have fun with what they do. Right. Um, you know, I, I still think back to, to my time in South Africa, I was lucky enough to run um, the transaction banking business for city there. Um, I remember one of the cultural things I was really trying to instill on people was come to work to have fun. Like, you shouldn't be here every day hating your job. You should be here because it's enjoyable, because you like the people you work with and because it's a fun place to be. So I think those are the things. I think one, don't hold yourself too, too beholden to every decision that you're making. Pick a couple of key subjects that are highly transferable, usable across the board. Don't be too worried if you think you've picked the wrong, product, uh, wrong subject. You can always reinvent yourself. It's never too late to reinvent yourself. Um, and then lastly, travel and have fun. Will, I have two more questions left and then, you know, I, I'm going to thank you a lot for, for, you know, for this amazing session. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, so how do you try to improve yourself? Because I, I see you personally as someone who believes in, you know, a continuous learning journey throughout the life. So uh, do you have any go-to resources? Like, uh, do you read a lot? Do you, do you prefer watching podcasts? Like, Perfect. How, so, how do you do it? it so I, I, I would, before I even get into what you can do personally, um, the first thing I cannot stress enough is like self-development and becoming successful cannot be done on your own. Like it is impossible to do this by yourself. I, I want to be like categorical that the more people you have that care about your upliftment and your future and your growth, the better off or the more likely you are to be really, really good one day at what you do, right? So the first thing is you have to find mentors that will help you grow. I can pinpoint two to three key people in my whole career that have gotten me from a young junior green wet behind the ears sales guy into a well-experienced transaction banker. Like I would never have gotten there had it not been for mentors, right? Like people I can go and have an open conversation with, throw ideas at who can give me honest feedback and help to grow me. Um, you also need coaches that will develop you. So the way I think about this is mentors are people that are typically helping you grow your career from like two to three years plus, like that length of time out. Coaches are people that are helping you develop skill sets that you have between you know now and the next 18 months. Um, and then I think you need to find partners, right? You need to find people that you really enjoy working with who will one work well with you, but two will also help buffer the skill sets that you've got. You can't be good at everything. So finding people that you can rely on to execute in your day to day is kind of really key. So I always try and think about my like networking time and my networking experience in those three big buckets. Like who are the partners that I want to work with day to day? Who are the coaches that are going to help me make me better at my job that I'm in today? And then who are the mentors that are going to help me think long-term and really build and develop as I go? Because I think, and, and I genuinely say this, like the mentor component, I cannot stress enough, like working for good people and having good mentors is like, can often be the difference between success and failure. There are people that are often very genuinely invested in your success and others that are not. So that's a critical thing. Then the two things you can do for yourself. Um, Reading is like, I, I consume information and read like there is no tomorrow. Before COVID, when I used to have a commute um, and have a bit of time, I was probably reading somewhere between 20 and 25 books a year. Um, and that was partially through um, Audible and partially through just reading. Um, I don't read as much now just because of COVID, obviously, because no commutes. I don't have something to actually sit in front of and, and look at. But I would I would say reading is, is an absolutely essential skill. Um, you should be reading all the, like every single time, like, and you should always be trying to continuously learn. So I try and, try and tend to make some of my reading directive as well. And what I mean by that is one thing I'll say to people is if you want to be really strict with yourself about learning stuff, 
learn one new skill a year. I don't care what it is. Like it could be unrelated to your job. It could be a hobby. It could be anything, but I just keep <laughs> learning. Like if you have, if you set yourself a goal of learning one new skill a year, I can promise you now that you will continue to develop and you'll continue to stay focused. Um, and then the last one I would say is goal setting. So this may sound pretty cliche, but I really like the idea of well thought through goals. Um, I, I tend to like to ask people things like, where do you see yourself at the end of your career? If you look at the end of your career, what do you want to achieve when you're done? Um, and I like to have them think about it in a big, broad way. And the reason I, I say that is I really dislike the question of like, where do you see yourself in five or 10 years? Because if I look at when I started my, my city career, I would never have seen myself where I was after five years. And I would never have seen myself where I was after 10 years, right? And I think the problem with those five and 10 year questions is that they box people into very narrow perspectives and where and what they can be. And the problem with that type of thinking is, is that people tend to, people tend to then get upset with themselves when they don't achieve those things. What I, and that's why I really like this idea of like, get out there and like think about what it is you'd like to achieve and then work backwards because all of a sudden when i work backwards from the hey this is maybe where i would like to be and i try and emulate people that are where i, I would like to be you know you start to map pathways and you can set goals around what those pathways look like and the funny thing is is you'll realize that there are multiple pathways to actually getting to um that end outcome. So if you think about those multiple pathways and those multiple potential potential outcomes, instead of starting to see like narrow boxes, you start to see a lot of opportunity in front of you. You're right. You you start to think my career could end here. This is one area where I already tend to see there's an opportunity. There are 10 different pathways to get there. And all of a sudden everything looks like opportunity rather than like this constant narrowing down. It's like a five or ten year question. Correct. Yeah. Well, um, in relation to this, like, do you have any specific books, movies, or music that you think that it changed? Oh, or, you the, know, music we'll we'll spend the whole day uh, chatting about if it's if it's going to come down to music. I, I've got a very wide taste in music, um, so maybe we can narrow it. I'll tell you a couple couple movies. I'll start with a few movies, one or two series, and then a couple books for people. Um, the the movies Thank that you. have really like mm -hmm. had a pretty big or pretty significant impact with me are about they've often got a, a protagonist who's like very positive, has the right attitude, is gone through like hardship and like recovers. Like that's the way I think about them. So you're going to find movies like The Pursuit of Happiness was a huge movie for me. Um, I loved the movie October. I don't know if you've seen October I love Sky with Jake Gyllenhaal. October Sky is fantastic. He basically is like some kid from like a rundown town in the middle of the US who starts trying to learn how to launch rockets and eventually ends up working for NASA. Like really, really good movie. Um, there's a classic one in like um, Aaron Brockovich, which is just a great movie of someone who overcomes something that they really believe in um, and has to go through like massive amounts of personal sacrifice to do it. Um, the other ones, I mean, there's obviously a number of like different good business movies that are good. Like I, I enjoyed some of the old, like the, the golden oldies, like Glenn, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Um, like Alec Baldwin has like one of my favorite sales lines. Like he says, ABC, you know, always be closing, which is a, a, like a, a great sales line. Um, and then there's obviously some others like Boiler Room and Wall Street, which were really, really good and, and interesting um, movies to watch they probably haven't aged all that well though if i think about some of the concepts that those movies brought in um you know the, the <laughs> some of those like, Still, like some of yeah. those scenes are probably a little bit um a, a little bit they probably haven't aged massively well um series that have had a good impact on me i really enjoyed the men who built america it's like stories of industrialists who kind of tried to conquer you know what they were trying to go at in a specific field it was a very different time to what we're in now um, it's a discovery it's a sorry it's a it's a, a history channel um series that's well worth watching um, obviously, because I'm a car nut, uh, there's a great series called The Cars That Made America Great, which is like the story of Ford and Chevrolet and Dodge and all of the, the GM brands. So really, really good series that. And then Harley and the Davidsons as well. Like one thing that's really consistent across all those movies is very, very humble beginnings from a lot of them. So they've had to build themselves up from nothing. Um, and then lastly, books. Um, this is probably like a laundry list, but um, a couple that are like really good to me. Um, <laughs> Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Very, very good book. Like it's a great book around motivation, understanding why people do what they do. Um, there's a fantastic book called Dance With Chance by Anil Garba, um, Robin Hogarth, and then um, Spiros Makrodakis. Mm -hmm. Like it's a great book around, we often as people try to control everything that's around us. And what this book talks about is how much chance there is in what you're doing. 
and trying to figure out what you can control versus what you should actually just let be. And then it changes how you respond to things. It's a fantastic book. Um, how to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie, also awesome book. Um, Freakonomics, another great one. I'm sure people will have read Freakonomics. I'm hoping they have. And then a couple of forward-looking books. Um, there's a book called uh, Inevitable by Kevin Kelly, which I think is really good. Um, and then there's books like Jobs to be Done, The Platform Revolution, Life After Google. Those are all like really good books to, to read. And then the last two, just in terms of people, if anyone's going through like a little bit of hardship that I thought were really, really good. Um, the one is by Frankel, which is called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, really, really good book, somewhat aligned to some of the Start With Why things that Simon Sinek put out. Um, and then the last one I would recommend is mm -hmm. How Starbucks Saved My Life, which is a story about uh, Michael Gill. So anyone who is thinking about these decisions around like choosing the right subjects, going into the right topics, all that type of thing. Michael Gill was a McKinsey partner who lost his job and ended up having to work at Starbucks. Um, highly recommend that book. It is a fantastic story about a guy who reset his life and was able to reinvent himself by starting Grounds Up again. And went into it, by the way, wow. went into Starbucks when he was pretty much at the end of his career. Wow, okay. Well, we have a great list from you, Will, like, because normally what we do is, you know, we post a photo of the guest and just one book <laughs> next to it. But apparently, like, I'm, I'm going to ask my, you know, teammates, like, guys, we have to find a way, you know, <laughs> put all of these together in one post. Or maybe we're going to, you know, keep posting about your suggestions for a long time. But this is really helpful. Thank you so much. Will, these are all my questions. Like, I would like to sincerely thank you for, you know, trusting me with this, you know, taking your time from a Friday morning. I know, I know that you're just beginning your day and it's Friday night for us. So thank you tons for, for doing this because it means a lot to me. It means a lot to a lot of people in the network. So I don't know what else to say apart from say, saying thank you. No problem. I'm, and I'm thank you very much for inviting me. I, I really appreciate uh, everyone's time and for everyone for, for listening to my story. Uh, Will, by the way, while you were talking, there were some comments. So Fundos <laughs> said, hello, William, at some point. And then someone else said, you know, great pulse. And right now, um, I don't know who this is, but it, it just said William and some, you know, uh, exclamation points, <laughs> whatever. Um, so thank you so much. I will be saving the session on the Instagram account. So if, if someone just joined and wants to, you know, see the full video, they will be able to access it, you know, on Instagram and, you know, in a, in a couple of days from, from YouTube as well. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Will. See you. <laughs> Take care. Happy weekend. Bye.